a good conversation in the first session and for staying on schedule through the break, which I know is always a challenge. Um, we're now ready for session two um, to be led by Commissioner Don Palmer. Thank you, welcome. We're looking forward to a discussion now about ballot marking devices and the Help America Vote Act. And that's really what this is all about, is helping America vote. And these machines, these devices, um, are an important tool for election officials and voters seeking to provide accessible voting experience to voters with disabilities and to provide options to all voters. Um, before we move, we go forward, uh, let's talk a little bit about what is a ballot marking device for our viewers that may not know. Um, it's an important understanding of what we are referring to and with a voting machine, a ballot marking device, you know, through an electronic interface, uh, similar to the older DREs that are now being phased out, these machines will mark votes on physical paper ballots. In general, these ballot marking devices neither store nor tabulate a vote. The machines allow the voter to record votes on ballots that are then stored and then tabulated by independent scanners. The voter then uses the device to mark a ballot and takes the ballot over to a tabulator to cast it. Uh, so there's no tabulation, there's no connection to the internet. Um, it's, uh, there is a ballot and often a cast vote record of that uh, ca the ballot. So BMDs incorporate a variety of assistive technologies for voters with vision, mobility, or other disabilities. They allow voters to adjust the size of the ballots displayed on the screen. They can provide an audio read aloud function for voters, and it can present ballots um, in multiple languages. Uh, that, that is a need for both voters and election officials uh, to, uh, to help all voters. These machines have, uh, going back, I can remember back in 2006 and uh, the Automark, there's been a series of improvements from security and usability uh, and accessibility over those years, over the decade or more. Um, they're now being utilized in 36 states uh, across um, the country. The EAC has now, uh, by my review, certified uh, five vendors have brought their systems in for certification of uh, VVSG 1.0, our security, accessibility, usability, functionality, and has been certified by the EAC and by other states across the, uh, the country. And so um, these not only help voters with disabilities, but they help uh, every, everyday voters, every voter, um, prevent mistakes. And that's been mentioned before about Overvotes, undervotes, other mistakes, errant marks on a ballot. It really reduces the, the potential for Americans to make mistakes on their ballots and the potential that their that, that vote won't count. And so uh, during this session, we're gonna hopefully foster discussion about these, uh, these voting marking devices amongst election officials, voters with disabilities, advocates, and security officials. Um, given the extensive debate and use of these across the country, we want, to, we want to discuss the technology, where it's going, the opportunities it provides for voters, as well as how do we improve security with these systems. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach as the first panel. I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to introduce our panel, and then I'm going to give a lead-off question for each who will go about five minutes discussing sort of the broader issues, and then we're going to... Um, open it up to questions from the audience. So our distinguished panel, um, starting from my right, will be uh, Lou Ann Blake, who is the uh, Deputy Executive Director of the Blindness Initiatives, the National Federation of the Blind. Gemma Howell, who is a computer scientist with the National Institutes of Standards and Technology and NIST, who is a partner with the EAC uh, and our committees on developing standards, security, accessibility, usability, all types of functionality for the new systems, the new generation of systems. Anthony Albans, who is the Commissioner of Elections in Delaware, and Juan Gilbert, who is the Chair of Computer and Information Science and Engineering at the Department of the University of Florida. Um, so I'm gonna start off with lead, a lead-off question uh, for Luann Blake, um, and then allow them to launch into their, uh, their introductory comments. Uh, the NFB has been very active in protect, protect, protecting the voting rights established by the Help America Vote Act, which is the enabling legislation of the AC. Uh, Luann, can you tell us about the, your work in this area since HAVA and your efforts to ensure the importance of a private and independent vote? Oops. Gotcha, oh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
thank you to the Election Assistance Commission for the invitation to be here. Um, the National Federation of the Blind uh, is the uh, oldest and largest organization of blind people in the United States. Uh, one of the issues that's very important to our members, um, we are a membership organization, is voting. Um, uh, so we um, have, a, have a grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and under that grant, <clears throat> we provide a number of um, services to the protection advocacy um, voting advocates, to election officials, to election technology de developers, um, related to accessibility of the election process. Um, <clears throat> In addition to that, we've done a number of um, other advocacy efforts uh, related to um, uh, access to the voting process uh, by blind voters. Um, <laughs> that relates to um, accessible websites, um, online registration, online voter registration, um, and protection of ballot secrecy, um, in addition to um, accessible absentee voting. So um, one of our um, really important um, uh, activities that we, we do um, uh, is protecting uh, the secrecy of um, blind voters' ballots. And that's an issue that was discussed a little bit earlier in the first panel, and I think I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I want to do it from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, Protection or, or security and accessibility, it's not an either or. We have to have both because it really it's an issue of civil rights. Um, the, um, this country back in the 50s and 60s decided that uh, segregation is not equal, separate is not equal. Um, and um, so, uh, and it's no different with voting. Uh, the HAVA actually provided voters with print disabilities um, with first-class citizenship when it came to voting. Um, prior to HAVA, we had to vote with the assistance of a sighted person, telling our choices and hoping <laughs> that they actually marked our ballot the way we told them to. HAVA uh, enabled us to vote for privately and independently for the first time uh, as first-class citizens. Uh, and with the movement to paper ballots, um, that first class citizenship is now threatened. Um, we, um, of course, as you know, everybody, as Diane mentioned, paper ballots are not accessible. You cannot make them accessible. Um, and with the ballot marking device being relegated to um, the system used primarily by voters with disabilities. Um, many of these systems produce a ballot that's different in size and content from the hand-marked ballot. Uh, because these systems are used infrequently, poll workers do not know how to set them up, they don't know how to operate them. Um, and so our voting experience is not, is not equal to what other voters' experiences. Um, and the Americans with Disabilities Act requires that voters with disabilities have an opportunity to vote privately and independently that is equal to the opportunity provided to other voters. So, um, so you know, we are working um, to uh, have BMDs be deployed at polling places as the primary method for marking ballots. Um, that's one of our um, priorities right now um, as an organization. Um, we also um, uh, are focusing on um, poll worker training. Uh, that is <laughs> such a critical issue. Um, and um, ensuring that they are trained on the actual machine, uh, how to uh, set up and operate the machine, um, as well as um, ensuring that voters with disabilities are provided the opportunity to serve as poll workers. Um, so um, those are kind of our primary, our poll-based um, activities that we're focusing on right now. Um, we also, um, under our HAVA grant, 
um, work with um, election technology vendors um, to um, ensure that their systems are accessible um, and um, providing uh, materials um, that they can, uh, that protection and advocacy agency um, advocates can uh, use to um, ensure that uh, poll workers are trained properly, um, that um, uh, they can, you know, how to hold a voter registration drive focused on voters with print disabilities, um, and uh, providing them documents that um, uh, will educate blind and low vision voters and other voters with print disabilities about their rights um, as, uh, as voters. Um, so in a nutshell, that's kind of where our focus is on, um, on voting. Thank you, Luann. Uh, Gemma Howell, uh, NIST helps lead in the development of technical guidelines and election security efforts. What are some of the concerns about ballot marking uh, devices and, and systems, and how does NIST take those concerns into consideration when helping develop those standards? Thank you for the question, and uh, also uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, Commissioner Palmer, um, NIST helps assist in the development of the VVSG and the technical guidelines and requirements that go into uh, that document, uh, which is for the testing and federal certification of voting systems. Uh, just for context and scope, uh, those requirements uh, focus specifically on the uh, systems themselves, the voting machines themselves. And although we don't tend to touch on external processes, we may um, share references within that, uh, within the document uh, that point to other best practices uh, that could be useful outside of the uh, VVSG scope. Uh, that said, uh, some of the concerns that have come up and that uh, I want to highlight today that we address are, um, you know, preserving the accuracy of the final vote tally, uh, securing against attack or failure, uh, and then also voter privacy. So firstly, for preserving the accuracy of the vote, um, what I tend to point to there is how we include a software independence, which is if there is an issue with the software, uh, that cannot cause an unde undetectable change uh, or error in the election outcome. And so we make sure um, that that principle is applied throughout the, the VVSG uh, through prevention, detection, and uh, recovery. So not dependent on the software. Um, and of course, this will eventually lead to some more conversation around that, that this software independence uh, for ballot marking devices um, some, partially depends on how uh, reliably voters notice and correct errors or, and, and perform verification um, and also recovery, the ability for these ballot marking devices to produce the uh, artifacts used for audits later on. With regards to securing against attack and failure, uh, um, I'm, I primarily focus in the security area of the requirements. So we have a set of principles, guidelines, and requirements that focus on all the different security controls, things such as access control, data protection, system integrity, uh, and detection and monitoring. Uh, but taking a step further into that, we also focus on limiting the attack surface. One thing I want to highlight here is that we made sure that the scope was clear in that the voting system, including ballot marking devices, are not connected to any external network. So they don't touch the internet, they aren't connected to the internet, uh, and they would require an air gap. And this is to prevent things like uh, remote attacks, uh, nation state attackers being able to um, inject malware or manipulate votes and things like that. Another way that we've limited the attack surface is by um, uh, setting restrictions that the voting system uh, or the ballot marking device included would not be able to broadcast wireless communications, so Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and things like that. And with everything that we've 
done as far as including these security controls, we reached out to our usability and accessibility team um, and made sure that we weren't impacting um, anything on their end as well. Uh, as, been, as has been mentioned throughout uh, this forum today, you know, it, security and accessibility go hand in hand and they need to be talked about together. And so we work with our accessibility uh, team to ensure that none of the requirements impact the accessibility. And so those wireless requirements um, don't impact the use of a voter's assistive technology. Uh, we ensure that there were alternative ways for um, voters to use their wireless communication technology with a ballot marking device. And then lastly, voter privacy. Uh, so voter privacy, there is a, a whole principle on voter, pri voter privacy uh, as well as ballot secrecy. Um, and that's ensuring that the voting system is designed and deployed to enable voters to obtain a ballot, mark, verify, and cast it, uh, all without revealing their selections, including their ballot selections, their language selections, uh, display information, um, without having to interact with anyone else. And I think I'll, I'll stop there and wait for questions I'm sure later. you'll get some follow-up <laughs> yeah, questions. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to now turn to Anthony Albans. Uh, uh, Delaware recently adopted ballot marking devices um, across the state. And could you please tell us about the planning and the implementation of that system across the uh, state and how that process is ongoing? And you know, what feedback have you got from election officials, local election officials, and uh, voters, if, if you... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Palmer and uh, fellow EAC commissioners and staff for putting this together, and thank you for the invitation. Um, as you mentioned, Delaware did recently, um, we recently undertook a complete upgrade of our election systems and elections uh, technology, including polling place uh, voting machines. Just a little background about Delaware and about our elections because of our size. Obviously, Delaware is a small state, um, and that brings us a lot of advantages, a lot of functions uh, in Delaware that may be handled at a local level level and other jurisdictions are handled at the state level in Delaware. So we're unique in the sense that our office, the Department of Elections, is a single statewide department. We manage everything top to bottom. There are actually no local elections officials per se. Everyone works for us, so to speak. Um, and um, so we manage everything and, and procurement of equipment, uh, policy, technology, everything. Um, so when we sought to um, trans to uh, move into the realm of new equipment. Just to give you a little background, we did have uh, statewide uh, DRE equipment. Uh, we had the uh, uh, Danaher Controls uh, Machine 1242, which worked very well for us, honestly. We had it for 20 plus years. We first implemented it in 19, uh, mid 90s, 1996 was the first full implementation in a presidential year. Um, it was, you know, as many of you may be familiar with it, it was a product of uh, 1980s technology at, at best. Um, worked again for us, but the accessibility piece um, that was available was rather limited. Um, there was an audio recording of the device. It was rather challenging to create that recording. It was very manual, uh, labor intensive, and it was very limited in its scope. Um, and it really, uh, it did offer uh, the basics of, of providing an accessible experience, but it was certainly lacking, you know, given today's uh, technology. So when we began the process of upgrading our equipment, we, we made the accessibility uh, concern was a top priority for us. One of the advantages that we had, even with our legacy equipment, as we call it now, was that we could provide an experience for the voter that was um, did not require use of any distinct equipment, uh, any kind of distinct voting machine or ballot marking device, and that was a priority going forward. What we, um, just fast forward a little, what we did, uh, our process, uh, which did include engagement of the accessibility community locally, uh, was we actually were em empowered through our state legislature, our general assembly, we had a task force. It was initially called Voting Machine Task Force. It really kind of the scope grew to be a, the entire system upgrade. And that included a whole host of people, ele elected officials, technology folks, elections <laughs> officials, a, a ver variety of folks, and who independently evaluated our equipment um, bids, uh, all based upon the, the very strict state uh, bidding requirements. What we ended up choosing, and it was actually independent evaluation, and it was a unanimous choice by all of the members of the committee, was an ESNS product. We used the Express Vote XL. Many people may be uh, familiar with the Express Vote. The XL is essentially similar uh, technology, but with a larger format, a screen. 
And the reason that that was chosen in Delaware, just again, more background on that, Delawareans uh, are used to voting a full face ballot. Our legacy machines had that. Um, our ballots in Delaware are relatively simple. Um, we don't uh, historically have ballot questions, uh, things of that nature. Um, actually, our General Assembly has to, in fact, authorize ballot questions to appear on our ballot. So it's very, very rare. I mean, it's been 30 plus years since we've had a ballot question, just to give you a context. Um, so our ballots are you know, fairly simple compared to a lot of other jurisdictions. So the equipment that we chose, again, provided um, that full, full face experience but again, was a ballot marking device. That was one of our key components, was the, um, the paper trail, an auditable paper trail, voter verifiable paper trail. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the accessibility piece was, was key. We did not, um, it was a non-negotiable that uh, voters would, would need to use any equipment distinct from the standard voting machine. And the response to the machines, we've had them for over a year now. We've utilized them um, in uh, our statewide school board elections. Again, we, again, our office, we administer any kind of election in Delaware, we do it, you name it. So um, we've used it for statewide school board elections. We've used it for a number of school referenda, including a very heavy turnout referenda just last week in Sussex County in the, the beach areas, um, and various municipal elections, and obviously ramping up for this year's elections. Um, the feedback has been, has been quite positive on it. Um, we are very happy with the technology that was available. Uh, this, this device utilizes uh, what's called the UVC, a universal voting console, um, which provides a lot of modalities. Uh, it, it, it does provide braille. It provides differently shaped um, uh, indicators and buttons, raised edges. It includes um, interface for sip and puff and other modalities, something we never had in the past. Um, and what's also nice about that, in addition to that, the equipment itself does provide some features, again, that were never possible with our legacy equipment. Um, screen uh, size enlargements, enlarging the contests on the screen, use of contrast, um, a whole host of features that we never, never had. And one of the priorities that we've had, and we, we've done this over the years, but one of the priorities that we've done, especially with our new equipment, in the training of poll workers, uh, which was touched on earlier, which is essential, we have uh, really stressed that the, uh, the technology that's available, we want our poll workers to be fully engaged with it. We want them to try it. We want it to be offered to any voter um, that would like to utilize the technology. And this, again, has been something I think we've done a good job on in the past, but we're trying to, even, to do even better, addressing some of those issues that have come up earlier in the panel in the first session. We, we never want there to be an experience in our polling places where the, the equipment is not ready to go by someone to come in, anyone to access it, anyone to utilize the technology. And we have been very um, fortunate that our poll workers have been very receptive uh, to this. They've in fact embraced it and we've, we've made it a priority for them to know that part of their job is to serve all the voters that come in and to provide an experience that, an experience of service, an experience of uh, convenience and, and an, uh, an experience of trust of the process that's consistent across the board. So um, that's been very, um, very successful for us. Um, we also um, wanted to be sure that, and again, this was touched on in the first panel as well, that not only w would voters um, who may need to access the accessibility options have any distinct experience, as, such as using other equipment. But we also wanted them to know that um, their vote it will uh, also be included in all of the post-election auditing and, uh, type of activities that we will be engaging in. Part of uh, legislative changes that came about in Delaware with the adoption of the new equipment, now that we have a paper trail, were audit requirements. So the ballots uh, that are cast using um, the assistive technology are in no way distinguished uh, from any of the other ballots and are fully included in the auditing process. So that was a key priority for us, and um, that's also been successful. So um, so far, we're, you know, we're, we're quite happy with it. Obviously, we're coming into the higher volume use of the equipment with the election cycle we're in now, but um, we have every confidence that um, things will be uh, moving forward well and it'll be a good experience for all our voters. Well, thank you, Anthony. I'm sure that uh, 
Uh, there's some questions about that, sure, and we'll sure. get some questions sure. on the implementation mm -hmm. and how well it's going and some um, maybe criticism. But um, let's talk next. We have Juan Gilbert, uh, who's with the University of uh, Florida, computer scientist who's focused on voting and security. And um, he actually, they, uh, he leads up a laboratory that I had a pl the pleasure of visiting, and um, he was able to show me some ballot marking devices and potential future technology in this area. And could you please provide us your perspective on some of the research uh, into ballot marking devices and where it's going? So good morning, everyone. So good to see so many of you that I know. And um, in my comments, I want to start with paper ballots first and give some of the research and some things about paper ballots. Um, paper ballots are the reason we're here in the first place. Uh, but let me point out a couple of things. First of all, uh, you can hack paper ballots. Um, so let me run through those real quick. Um, there's a contest, and the candidates are Daffy Duck, Bugs Bunny, and some others. I don't like any of them, so I don't vote for them. The, my ballot's turned in, and then an insider simply says, I want Bugs Bunny to win. Ooh, it's blank. Guess what I'm going to do? I circle Bugs Bunny. Impossible to detect unless you catch the person in the act of doing it. It takes less than three seconds. And anyone can do it with a pen. That's called the undervote hack. The overvote hack is they voted for Daffy Duck, but I really want Bugs Bunny to win. So I circle in Bugs Bunny. That causes an overvote. So I didn't give Bugs a vote, but I took away one from Daffy. Um, we heard earlier about, uh, Doug, sorry, Minnesota, uh, stray marks. In security, the first thing you hear a security person say is, we need paper ballots because we can audit them. Hand marked paper ballots compromise the audit because voter intent is decided by individuals other than the voter. The stray marks, things that occur, are going to be judged by other people, and they determine the outcome of that. Then there's the issue, and there was a study done at Rice in 2006 that showed 11% of hand-marked paper ballots had an error. 11%? Uh, that covers the margin of victory in a lot of places. And so now um, I want to make a bold prediction. For those of you, there's a panel later about absentee. There's a problem with absentee, which is uh, signature verification. We know about that. And that problem is increasing. Why? Because voters who are, people becoming eligible voters don't sign anymore. Kids don't write their signature. So how do you verify a signature? You can't. So here's the prediction. Handmarked paper ballots will suffer the same consequences because kids don't mark ovals. They don't take tests like I did growing up. Ovals and things don't happen for them. So what's going to happen when their first experience is a handmarked paper ballot with an oval? Chaos. <laughs> so we have to move in a different direction, whether we like it or not. It's going to happen. So what are the issues with ballot marking devices? There have been studies that have uh, made observations that people uh, do not verify the, the printout on the paper ballot. Now notice what I said. The studies say they do not. They did not say they cannot. There's a big difference. So in a recent study, uh, there were observational studies, the one with the LA system, 51% of the people looked at the ballot uh, and spent two minutes uh, looking at it, but they didn't do a study to determine if votes were flipped. There was a recent study in Michigan where they actually flipped votes and 40% of the people looked at those, 7% found the error. Uh, with an intervention such as signs and telling people to look at it, it went to 95% looked and over 80% caught it. So here's an idea. Have the voting machines in a row in one place, have poll workers behind them, and have ballot boxes or scanners behind them and have poll workers say, look at your ballot. Verify your ballot. That will significantly get voter verification up. Um, we did a study with Prime 3. Um, Prime 3, for those of you who may not know, is an open source uh, voting system we created. It is the first 
voting system that was designed with universal intent, period. We did this in 2002 in response to HAVA. And we were told, you can't create one machine that everyone can vote on. Now we see we were right. Everyone's doing it. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Express Vote from ESNS was modeled after Prime 3. Uh, Dominion's image cast, they didn't say it was modeled after Prime 3, but it looks a lot like it. Uh, VSAP, the LA system, has a lot of those properties. We created a way that to bring in the QR code, scan it. We demonstrated that with the Presidential Commission on Election Administration in Cincinnati, actually. We did a demo of that. So the research and development in these areas are there to make ballot marking devices work. And they should be used in universal design. And the other argument is with respect to security the number of people who vote with a disability exceed the margin of victory. If only people with disabilities voted using an accessible device, a hacker is excited by that. What's the probability that a blind person is going to see that I changed the written text? But if everyone's voting on that, the probability of someone seeing that that machine is misbehaving goes up. From a security perspective, if you only have people with disabilities voting a certain way, you have actually weakened the security of the election given the number of people with a disability that vote. It is imperative not to do that. Uh, Diane was asking about segregation. There's a proper segregation. Everyone votes on the universal design machine, and the people who have an issue with it do a hand-marked paper ballot so we can see how they voted. <laughs> That's the proper segregation. <laughs> I would say that with respect to digital ballots, uh, unfortunately, given the state of current technology, we cannot secure a digital ballot, meaning you cannot have a ballot of record that is digital. And there's so many ways to, to, to mess with that. Now, voting remotely, yes. You can deliver a digital ballot, have it printed, mailed in. Uh, we experimented with something called televoting, the idea that you could get a ballot, mark it, and then when you're ready, press a button and it prints in the precinct and you can have a camera where you can see it actually print. Uh, so there's innovation in, in, out there that can help move things along, but I, I would just say there is no compromise. Accessibility right now, when, when, you, when you talk about accessibility, it is the security in the sense that if you don't have accessibility, you have already compromised the election. The numbers by themselves to dictate that we must have people come along. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. <coughs> With that, um, I, I think we'll, I'd like to turn it over to Doug Chapin to ask some questions from the audience, uh, some follow-up questions, some, some new questions if you'd like one or more people to answer, just go ahead and uh, state that, or, or if it's directed at a particular person. Uh, thank you, uh, Doug. Wonderful. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I will note that we only have about 10 minutes left in the panel, so we are starting with the lightning round um, <laughs> this time um, around. Um, start right down here in front. Hi, my name is Tian Ellis, and I'm from SAVE, Self-Advocates Becoming Empowered. My question is for Juan, will you please tell people um, how you came to our National Self-Advocacy Conference and um, tested out the Prime 3 and worked with us and then gave people an opportunity to actually comment on how to improve the Prime 3? Because I think that's very important. Not a, we're talking about accessibility here. We need more people with disabilities involved testing these machines, being a part of the training for poll workers, and if you really want to make things accessible, nothing about us without us. Yeah. Thanks, Dia. So, um, Prime 3, again, <laughs> we created it's open source. The EAC, uh, through the Accessible Voting Technologies Program, helped support that work. We did do pilots in various states, and we did do a pilot with SAVE. We got tremendous feedback, and, that, and some of that stuff has been implemented in, in future designs, like Express Vote. I will say the big takeaway from our SAVE uh, pilot 
was we put pictures on the, on the ballot. So if you don't know, SAVE uh, voters have various levels of reading comprehension and literacy. And we were not about to ask them, can you read? We put pictures on the ballot, we had audio, and they were able to vote. And we noticed some people were using the pictures. So as a result of the SAVE experience, we said, could this actually work? We went to an <laughs> elementary school where we knew the kids couldn't read and uh, did a study, and they were able to vote using the pictures. So next up, pictures on ballots. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? All right, so I've got one for the, I, oh, would we have someone? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Sylvia with the Common Cause. Um, I'm just wondering if you guys can talk, there are lots of different types of ballot marking devices out there. Um, and there are things with barcodes and all of these other, these options. Can you talk, can you give us kind of best practices? What are, in your expertise, what are the best, best ones out there? What things should we be looking for when we are advocating for our local election officials and purchasing their ballot marking devices? Like what things to, to highlight? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I can just offer a comment. I think one of the best practices is you know, the devices, many of them do use barcodes, as you know. One of the things that we implemented with our audit requirement in Delaware is that the auditing is all hand counting human readable text. Right. Any of our audits do, do not, um, a, a recount, if you will, or a rescan of the barcodes is not sufficient. Uh, I literally did one yesterday, I'm doing another one tomorrow, um, where we sit in and we literally have teams and we literally hand count the, the, the human readable text. I think that's really the only way to go. Um, that's the only way you're going to reassure folks that people are looking at it, people are checking it, and that they can be trusting the results. It's worked well for us. Mm -hmm. Let me give you real quick uh, for the security people who may push back on that. So if you say I'm going to have a ballot marking device and it has a QR code and human readable text on it, and you're going to audit the human readable text, and you say, well, we're going to do the audit. We'd like to do a risk limiting audit. And someone says, well, how do you know the barcode? Just ask this question. Will a risk limiting audit get the outcome correct? They will say yes. Security people will never say a risk limiting audit will, will fail. Mm -hmm. So always throw that back at them. Say, if I use a barcode and I do an audit on the human readable portion, will the RLA work? And they will say yes, and you're done. Do you mind if I make one more quick yeah. comment on that? Actually, with regards to the type of audit, what we do in Delaware, the way our legislation is written, ours actually are not risk limiting. We, in fact, do an entire race, we have, I won't go into all the details, but we do entire races, we do what we call election districts, precincts. We count an entire precinct, we count all the machines in the precinct, every office, you know, or we choose an office. Um, so it's very thorough. And so we, we literally are looking at all the results of a, of a district, comparing it to the reported results. And uh, we found that works really well for us. It's a little time consuming, but um, if you do it right and you get into a rhythm, you can do it efficiently. Mm -hmm. Some other, um it's on. It's on. Okay. Some other um, uh, items, best practices that you would want to consider. There are a number of second generation machines out there that do not have the capability of uh, enabling a blind voter to verify the ballot once it's been printed. So that's an important consideration. Um, also, um, having the BMD uh, implemented as being the primary ballot marking method in the polling place is, is an important uh, best practice as far as we're concerned um, because that way you ensure that the poll workers are trained um, on the machine. They know how to set up and operate the machine. The machine will be set up when a blind voter shows up at the polling place. Um, uh, also, um, um, uh, pretty much all, well, all the ballot marking devices have the various accessibility features that um, Commissioner Palmer talked about at the beginning, um, but its uh, usability of some of those systems varies. Um, so uh, some of the machines require you to scroll, th scroll through a menu um, to enable the accessibility features. Mm. Um, that's not 
not not the best way to do that. So um, that's another important consideration to, to look at, how the accessibility features are enabled. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of prerogative. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Um, and this really is for Gemma, but uh, anyone can, and then we'll get it to any more questions, is, you know, there has been a discussion about security and accessibility and the design of equipment and how one can sort of supplement the other. Um, but there are, uh, people forget that there are a whole bunch of other features that are absolutely necessary, both under HAVA and otherwise, usability, functionality, affordability, a, b a bunch of other abilities. Uh, and Gemma, can you comment on that? And in, in, in is how we've designed the previous uh, BBSG standards um, and how we look at the future is it's not just a security accessibility, it's there's a lot of other abilities that are going on here. Yeah, I was actually <laughs> queuing up that to, to answer the, the previous question, but uh, yeah, to your point, in the VVSG, uh, we try to take all the different abilities into consideration. Um, my, my plug for the VVSG to the previous question was going to be uh, for ballot marking devices, um, you know, the, the requirements that we include in there, certainly um, we, we have a lot under the security section, but in that usability and accessibility section, a, 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 a term that I've learned is that universal design. Um, which, so we, we cover a lot more. Um, and it, we make sure that we cover the different areas um, within, um, the, we cover various areas as far as um, different accessibility needs. Um, and so we're not only targeting one and to make sure that you're, you're thinking about that and including all of that um, when developing these ballot marking devices or thinking about what you need within a ballot marking device, making sure that you have all of the necessary um, uh, usability and accessibility needs, um, as well as the um, the security needs, um, even beyond that interoperability and things like that. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, Doug, go ahead. This is Diane Golden, and I'm just going to add from the TGDC perspective and in, in answer to that question about ballot marking devices. So you've got to remember. They need to be an accessible ballot marking, verification, and casting device. The name ballot marking device alone is a problem. If that's all it does, it's a problem. Accessibility is the, you have to have accessibility of the entire voting process. It's not just marking the print ballot. It's also someone who can't see, being able to verify that printed ballot. It's also someone who has no use of their hands being able to cast that paper ballot, mm -hmm. privately and independently. So when you look at a ballot marking device and you want to know if it's actually providing accessibility, it is not just marking. And in fact, I wish we could get rid of the name ballot marking device because that's, that leads people to believe that's it. That's all it needs to do is accessibly mark and it needs to verify and cast privately and independently for somebody who has, you know, any range of disabilities. That's the big task. The, the crop of ballot marking devices do a good job on, of marking in general, and most of them do an abysmal or no job of verification and casting. And that's what LA was trying to solve, that's what people have been trying to solve, but that would be my advice to anybody looking at buying a ballot marking device is to make sure that's not all it does accessibly. You know, with that, I, I would just say, uh, Diana, I, I think there's general agreement, and I would say that you know, Help America Vote Act is is help all Americans vote. And, you know, it's there may be a slogan that, you know, we all must vote on paper ballots, but that's just simply not possible for all Americans to actually physically mark a ballot and physically cast it. There has to be other alternatives and uh, accessibility features into these type of systems. And so when we are designing equipment and we're criticizing or critiquing a voting system, things might not be perfect for all into, you know, in, in the opinions of everybody, but the Help America Vote Act is Help All Americans Vote Act. Mm -hmm. All right. That brings us to the noon hour. Um, I want to thank um, the panel. Um, Commissioner, I don't know if you have any um, final wrap-up remarks. Um, I think that uh, I want to thank the panel for uh, this interesting discussion of BMDs. I'm sure it will continue throughout the day. Thank you. <laughs>